Hi, welcome to the Tumbling Down podcast, a podcast that's going to be focused on the Vermont music scene and how it relates to the Oxbow Music Festival um, and beyond. Uh, today's episode, uh, we will be tumbling down the road with Lee Ross, saxophone player extraordinaire, loop station producer. Uh, Lee's going to be playing the Oxbow Music Festival Saturday, July 23rd. Tickets are on sale now. And this is my sit down interview Zoom cast with Mr. Lee Ross. Enjoy. All right, this summer, the Oxbow Music Festival is back for our seventh show. Presented by Elmore Mountain Therapeutics, Saturday, July, July 23rd, featuring Dogs in a Pile, Marcus Rezac's Shred is Dead, Seth Yacoboni and Friends, The Worm Dogs, Lee Ross, Wavy, Gravy, Gary Wade. See you this summer, y'all. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. Welcome. Hey, Lee, how's it going? Oh, it's going fantastic. Thanks for uh, taking some time out of your schedule to uh, chat with me. Absolutely. I, you know, right back at you. I appreciate you uh, having me on here. Yeah, man. I uh, saw your uh, most recent tour post for the summer. Really like robust. Looking. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it came together pretty nicely. I was happy with how that worked out. Yeah, your, uh, your spring dates were like equally impressive in number and girth. Um, and your summer dates look great too. I started to look at some of them. Um, it looks like I know you're going to be at Hit Jam, yep. Um, which is of a you know good friend of mine, you know all friends of ours that are putting it on in Vermont. Um, and then uh, obviously the Oxbow Music Festival yep. for my show on July 23rd, which we're super stoked about. Um, but it looks like you got just fun. So are you like home right now? I am. I am home right now. This you're is home. Uh, you're home. This is, uh, yeah, middle middle of the week. Uh, this is uh, I guess. I guess this is technically my little bit of my day or two of downtime in between uh, spring and summer tours, I guess, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, um, did definitely did some traveling at the beginning of the winter that uh, took me a bit, a bit further. Uh, and I got that uh, um, happening at the end of this, but for, for at least for the next like couple months, uh, it, it's a, it's a lot and there's a lot going on, but none of it is extraordinarily far. So I don't have to leave home for too, too long, which is nice. I saw a North Carolina date on there. Yeah. How, yep. um, are you just going to play like one show down there? What's, what's happening there? Uh, I have a little, I have like a, a long weekend for that one. I have um, that, that particular place that I'm playing down there is, is in a place called Jimmy's. It's in Wrightsville Beach. And I've been cool. playing there for a long time. Uh, my old band, the Hornets used to play there and, when uh, when I first found that place, they they had just started. They just started out. You know, not not many people were coming there. Um, fast forward now, about like six years later, and it's like one of the hottest places in like almost the whole country. I mean, every every time I'm there, whether it's a weekday or weekend, that place is just jamming. And they are are big supporters of the whole Lee Ross thing. And so I got they I bumped up to being able to get uh you know back to back nights there, which is awesome. Nice uh, double, double down. And, for that weekend, I also I got on. There's a, a festival that I played at a, a few years ago, and they had taken a few years off. It's called Pink Moon Festival, and that's in West Virginia. It's so only about three or four hours away from from Jimmy's. So uh, packing a packing a pretty uh, heavy week, just a quick blast weekend. Dude, that's uh, that's awesome. I'm gonna see if I can't pull up. I had a um, I took an image of that tour poster because I wanted to show people. 
what was going on. I might have to put it in in post because um, this is might, super good for me. Let's see if I am up. Oh, only the host can share. I tried to share it, but it only would let you. There it is. Let me try that. Oh, cool. It's like upside. Does it look upside down? <laughs> it's behind you. That's that's wild. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of that. It didn't come out right, but I will. <laughs> I just want to let people know that you're basically on I the mean, road. You're everywhere it, it, in you're everywhere in New England. It's everywhere in New England. Uh, I have another festival in August that's happening in uh, in up. I think it's technically upstate New York in uh, Coimans Hollow. This festival called Trout Stock, put on by the band yeah. uh, on Trout. Um, but you're right. It is. I as I was putting that together, I kind of didn't realize it because I just it's been like just kind of like, you know, turning and burning in the, on, on the, uh, the booking side of things, you know, just quickly put in the calendar. All right, it's gone to the next one. And so it wasn't until like a few nights ago when I actually just kind of mapped it all out, looked at it. I was like, wow, it's, I, I usually, I mean, I usually do, you know, stay in the, whoops, so usually do stay in the new England, uh, situate, you know, area, but I, I, I definitely am hitting Maine a lot more on this trip, which I've been trying to do. Um, you yeah. know, try most of it. Maine, like, I don't know. I mean, I only see and know what I see and it seems like they're constantly posting like a new camp out festival situation in Maine like all the time and it's awesome it's like here we are post pandemic cannabis companies are like popping off so like we're working with a few in Vermont it just seems like the cannabis companies are super like want to be involved too and I don't know if it seems like it's like kind of similar in Maine it's like these cool like collaborative you know jam jam camp outs are just happening you know what it is? I, I, I definitely noticed that as well. And I think what it is, um, I think it's not just not just the cannabis culture of it, but I think the I think the local governments of each state, just from you know, outside looking in. But it just seems like Massachusetts has tried to kind of even as much of a liberal state as it is. It see that there's less and less of those happening in this state. So I don't know if it's like a permit thing in this state. New Hampshire, not quite as liberal of a state, so not maybe the greatest place to be uh, rolling in with a big, crazy uh, fest, music festival. Yeah. Vermont, as liberal as it is, they don't seem to want their land trashed by music festivals. Um, and, but Maine seems like kind of there's a lot of land out there yeah. in Maine. Yeah. And they're just kind of like, go ahead, do whatever you want out there. So, yeah, um, Vermont's, um, I mean, yeah, you have to find the right as, as like a, producer or promoter you got to find the right slice of land and and, and land it ain't cheap um, yes. and then yeah. the permit process in vermont to have large-scale events is really rigorous um and built and put in the law to really deter such events um that's not to say that people can't get around them and host large-scale events but it seems like for vermont it's more about these like craft little small grassroots type events that Right. really are for like the people that live like right there you're not getting early you like yeah. yeah exactly um but um yeah so your schedule looks good man um thank you I, very I, much i know you've been working on this music thing for a while could you just maybe take a few minutes to bring us back to like like where did where did you grow up late ross uh so i uh, i grew up uh, just outside of new haven connecticut and um which is, you know, a very, very rich, you know, music scene. Um, but, you know, mo my, my mom and my brother are both musicians. So, you know, that was a big influence. There's always my whole family in general was just always very big music fans. So I was always surrounded by, by, you know, you know, a good, a good, a good exposure to good music. And, you know, um, so and what, that, kind of, what kind of albums with vinyl, right? Vinyl spinning in your house when you were, uh, there's definitely some vinyl spinning in the house pretty regularly. So, um, my whole family were big Billy Joel fans, which, uh, always, which always a good, you know, is a, is a great influence. My mom's a piano player, so she was always making sure I was practicing. Uh, my brother is a, uh, is a drummer, so I was exposed to Rush and Led Zeppelin and The Doors extraordinarily heavily. Um, nice. For me, it was a lot of cassettes, a lot of cassettes. I was rewinding okay. tapes with the old pencil, you know, yeah, you know traps. There, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Back it up. But and my sister was a huge music fan, even though she was a musician, she was just you know, had a great ear for music. So there was like a lot of, you know, David Bowie and Genesis played all the time. So just you know, really a you know a lot of exposure to you know just about everything. And then as um, as I got into high school, I started playing saxophone, and uh, my brother uh, 
noticed noticed that I was like, oh, you should be listening to ska and you know P funk. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got my first B- Mighty Mighty Boston CD. I was like, oh wow, ska's very cool. And got into a ska band in high school. Um, played my first uh, one of my first shows ever. I played at Toad's Place because it was like you know they would have all ages ska shows. Yeah, you know. At, at such a historical venue like that. I don't think at the time I was like 16 years old. I don't think I realized how cool that was until I moved away and realized that there aren't iconic little music clubs that are, you know, bringing all ages shows all the time. So it's, uh, yeah, it was a very, very lucky to be exposed to that and have those outlets and, um, found some people in high school that were also, you know, like-minded that were also really, uh, excellent musicians and some good lucky, lucky, uh, lucky placement on that. Um, and then uh, I went to uh, college at Boston University and just never quite left this area. Okay. Uh, I went to, I was a computer science major in school, but a lot of my friends were all going to Berkeley. I was you yeah. know, more interested in music than playing, than computers and uh, just, you know, made sure to uh, keep, keep doing my practicing, uh, took some lessons at Berkeley um, and we'd, we'd play in various bands here and there, but, uh, and then I uh, linked up with a, a trombone player who I worked with, uh, ended up for about 10 years. We were started off as a horn section for hire, but then we formed our own little duo called the Hornets. And that's where I kind of learned about the whole live looping uh, thing and, and uh, <laughs> polished up those chops. And uh, that brought me, uh, brought me to what I'm doing today. That's, that's awesome. So when you were at BU and taking lessons at Berkeley, um, well, let's back it up a little bit. So in your household, you were you know, exposed to, like, I'm really always interested in like, like how did people get involved? Like, why are they so passionate like in their instrument particularly? So I was like, just curious to know, like, so you, you grew up on, on Bowie and Rush and, and all the, the different tapes. And then you were introduced to Ska and the P-Funk. Is that, is that when the horn thing clicked? Or were you, did you take horn like as like a band instrument? Uh, it was a band. I, I, I always wanted to play piano. It's, it's a very weird story. But when I was very, very young, when my first musical memories was, I, I think uh, I really, I really hated having to wear a suit. Like for some reason, I, I there was like, uh, going out to like family events or whatever. I had to wear a suit one time and I hated those dress suits. I thought they were so uncomfortable. And uh, we had a VHS of Billy Joel playing live in Long Island, one of his like famous live albums. Yeah. I'm watching the video and he's got a suit on, and he's got sneakers on with the suit. And I, I thought that was, that was awesome. So I was like, so if I get, if I can play piano and play music, that means I can wear sneakers with my suit. Yeah. Um, which I don't, which I, which I learned is not really the case, but, uh, <laughs> but, <Good. laughs> uh, that, but at the time that was my encouragement, you know, for playing piano and I, um, I always had the entertaining, I was, I, I, I always had a, a bit of an entertaining bug. Yeah, I, um, no, for sure. Music definitely provided an outlet for that, but I was, uh, my family were also really big fans of Saturday Night Live. Yeah, same. And, um, the, uh, I, I went in the, in the elementary school talent show in fifth and sixth grade, I recreated some Saturday Night Live sketches. <laughs> Nice. I did the uh, I, I re I re I performed the uh, Dan Aykroyd for, uh, as Julia Child cutting herself and bleeding yeah. all over the place. Oh I, did that, I did that one in fifth grade. That was that got a, some great reactions. I'm sure that was a huge pop in the crowd. For that. Oh man, that was I had I had <laughs> things of food coloring up my sleeve and I was bleeding everywhere on stage. And then um, I, also I see. Did, I did the uh, the bassomatic where he uh, puts a fish just blends a fish. And that's oh yeah. Amazing. So I did that on stage. I, I blended a live a fish on stage and had my principal come up and I kind of did a little cup switch and had her drink it, do a little taste test. And I, I had, I mean, I had that crowd just rocking. And I, so it's, well, music is, you know, definitely a passion. I think it's, it's the end. I, 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 I love entertaining. I love, I love making people laugh or smile. I, I get, okay. I get a, get a lot out of that. And uh, that's where a lot of it comes from. So, all right, real quick. Yeah. Are you going to be doing any stand up? sets in the future <laughs> you know i i don't believe so I, I i have had some thoughts about doing that i, I listen to a lot of stand-up comedy and and uh i it is I, you know the, with, with those things that was more of like a those were more like a an act or a sketch as opposed yeah. to just stand-up comedy stand-up comedy I, I i have so much respect for them i mean that's so many words and so much talking and you have to just keep that moving yeah or you know just a minute or a couple minutes can seem like an hour Right on. So no, no, no stand-up comedy in your near future, but that's okay. I, I, I'm going to keep, 
I'll probably not. They're not in the horizon. I might, I might sneak in. Uh, I might have some, uh, some material in between songs as I'm, okay. you know, setting up for the next tune. You got to keep a little banter. Going. Yeah. A little, little banter to try and keep people laughing and not just your normal banter, but, uh, you know. So, uh, take us back to Berkeley for a minute when you were taking those lessons, who, yeah. who was, who was your instructor? So my first, uh, my first lessons were from this guy named George Garzon, who's one of the Dude, George Garzon. He's the man. He's that when I when I left high school, my teacher in high school, I was like, "Well, I'm going. To, I'm moving to Boston. Where who should I learn from?" He's like, "Well, George Garzon." I was like, "Oh, okay." And so I happened wow. to go to um, I went to a show uh, pretty early on at the middle e at the Middle East downstairs. It was like a big you know jam session, but it was like uh, but John Modesky was in it, and I was a big Modesky Martin and Wood fan. Like, oh, let's go see that. It was some very avant-garde jazz. I wasn't exactly prepared with help for how avant-garde that show was going to be, but George Garzon was playing too. That was another reason I was like, oh, we got to go to this show. And so I just like, kind of you know, tapped him on the shoulder at one point. I was like, hey, my teacher told me to come find you. And uh, he, was a, he was a very righteous dude. He was very, uh, he, he was down to give me, give it a shot. Um, and it was, it was, it was very, it was it, a little intimidating. I walked up to that, that, I, you know, I went to his office and I'm walking down the hallway to get to his office and it's, you know, just a line of practice rooms filled with all these guys just ripping on the horn. And I, and I, I was just, I was, I was frightened. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I, I was like, I, I don't know where, what, I don't know if I'm in the right place right now. And uh, so I took a couple lessons from him and I had about some things to work on for a few years. I'm sure. Um, and then uh, a, a handful of years later, I, um, I was in the market for a, a practice room. These things I found called a whisper room. That's like a sound module. So that, you know, I was living in apartments in the you know, downtown Boston. It's not the easiest thing to practice. The saxophone, no one wants to hear that. Right. But these whisper rooms, they um, you know, block out the sound. And I was in the market for one and uh, I found one on Craigslist and it happened to be, it was being sold by a teacher at Berkeley. Hmm. Um, and she's, uh, it was uh, Shannon LeClaire. Okay. Who's also one of, the, one of the top saxophone teachers, professors there. And, uh, and she's like, you know what? I was, I had someone else that wanted to buy it, but he, he was a singer. You're a saxophone player. I'll sell it to you. Nice. And actually I'll, 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 I'll pan around. You can actually see what I'm talking. I still have it here in my room. This is how I practice. But if you can see that, that kind of, oh, room, yeah. it's like a prefabricated room sort of wow. thing. You, strap, you screw the walls and strap the walls together. I've had that. I've had that for about, uh, 11 years, 12 years. Oops, sorry. My battery's getting low there. Uh, yeah, I got that awesome. And every so every time I move, I have to take that thing apart and carry. It's the worst. It's uh, I almost broke my back. I think on it last time, but um, so then I ended up. But I I, I met Shannon, and she uh, became my uh, my teacher for a while, and I learned a lot from her. And um, also she she was also a very prominent flute player, so I also took a bunch of flute lessons from her as well, and started my path down the, the flute. Just plugging my phone in here. Sorry about that. Am I no, still good? Am I good? Okay, good. You're good. Um, so she she was uh she was amazing. She actually toured around in the road show of uh the Barnum and Bailey Circus for a while in the pit band for that. Huh. And I never thought about how in incredibly crazy uh, circus music is to play for an orchestra. It's uh it's really something. But uh, anyway, so yeah, that was um so I got really fortunate and uh, in a very random coincidence to uh, stumbled upon uh, meeting her, and that helped out quite a bit. Yeah, I can imagine just looking at like the orchestral right out for the circus music and just how crazy like with the constantly changing dynamics and like tempos like changing all the time and super quick and there's like rapido is probably like on the orchestra sheet somewhere like rapido oh, I, 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 yeah it's, it's uh it's some that's like boot camp for i think for a for playing in general oh boy yeah um awesome dude. it sounds like you know you grew up super musical like you were kind of on that path um that was sounds like it's probably your, your calling you know, to, to do what you're doing, which is, which there, is awesome. I got, I got very lucky that there were a lot of things in place that were there. If I, if I, you know, for the take, for the taking, if you wanted to go down that path, uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that for sure. So you've, it seems like, you know, are getting to be known a, a bit about being like the guy that people want to come and sit in, um, at various events. I just was watching uh, a collab you did with Rob Compa, which looked like it was at like a, a street fair or a festival or something cool, like in a cool merchant's booth. <clears throat> Can you tell us like how that came about or if you have any more 
like duo collabs with him or anyone else or oh man i i, I love playing with rob he is uh he's such a great player and such a great dude um he he has you know i i so he that was a situation where he was sitting in with with me i i, I do yeah. I, I do a lot of the whole sit-in thing right. and I, just, I, yeah. I love doing that it, it's a great to get a chance to play with other uh other players or play with my friends who i don't get a chance to see as often or play with as often as i'd like to um but with rob um it was it's it's amazing how that happened and uh um he, he he's based in burlington and i i play up a, a whole bunch in burlington and me and my fiance always have such a great time when we're up there we have a lot of friends up in burlington it's gotten to the point almost we have we have more friends in burlington than we do around our hometown at this point um but we always stop going up there and um i don't remember i'm trying to think back to the actual very first time that happened um I, there at this at his uh his fiance owns a, um, a clothing store up in Burlington that we went to one day and my fiance and his fiance became very good friends. Nice. And, uh, and she's an amazing, um, she's an amazing person as well. Her store is called tail feather up in Burlington. So if anyone oh, yeah. checks this out is, uh, never is looking for some awesome, uh, hip, uh, hip, hip clothing. That's definitely the place to go check out. Um, but it was like right around that same time she became friends with uh, Kari is her name and uh, me and Rob he, he hit me up he's like hey if I, you know if you're ever playing or uh, um, I'm trying to quickly turn off that alarm I don't know if you can hear that but my my alarm that's telling me that I have an interview with my alarm that's my alarm that's telling me that I have an interview with you and uh, nice. to remind myself sorry about that no you're good um, man um good so uh, well that's awesome right on that same it was right around that same time and we uh, we we connected and he so he came in and sat in for a couple of tunes and he was having a blast and pretty much anytime the schedules line up if i'm in burlington and he's not on tour he's uh, he always comes out and plays and uh, he came out uh, a couple of weeks ago i played there and he played for like pretty much the whole show and he's just got such a great ear and a great feel for it um it's not it playing with my project is not the easiest thing because there's a lot of things that are you know once you get those loops going it's pretty much it's locked into a you know, more or less like playing to a metronome. There's not really a lot of give and take of, or movement, you know, as if you're playing with a full band. And uh, so it's, it's really cool. He's able to just sit right in there and always has a, it's always a good time playing with him. Nice. Nice. Yeah, no, it sounded really cool. It's like, it's a good, good collaboration for sure. And uh, we are hoping that we're going to see at least one or more collaborations at the Oxbow. Um, oh yeah. I've, I've heard rumors that we may see you, so you're opening up, we'll just talk about this for a few minutes before we wrap up. Sure. You know, sort of promo, but for real, like we're stoked to have you hey. up there. Like, like you're opening the show, which for us at the Oxbow is different in the yep. sense that we have always like, oh, let's ease into it. You know, let's put up, you know, a couple of acoustic guitars and, you know, maybe a string band. We usually kind of ease into the day, but this year we're like, no, nah, let's bring the dance party. Like, you, you know, you, you got reggae, you got funk. Um, you got the horn out, you got your loop station, which is awesome. So, you know, you're going to kick off the show with the dance party. And then we've got some great bands afterwards. And, you know, like I said, rumor has it, we may see you up there sitting in and that's going to just light the place on fire. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really hoping so. Uh, I'm really hoping that's going to be the case because there's some, that is an awesome lineup. And uh, there's some people on that lineup that I know and have played with before. And there's some people on that lineup that I've, uh, I've never gotten to see before. And I'm very excited to see you for the first time. And, uh, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what kind of uh what kind of magic is going to be going down that day which i'm sure there'll be a lot yes yes awesome well lee we look forward to that july 23rd at the oxbow have a great summer tour leading up to that and uh we'll look forward to seeing you in vermont awesome well, thanks a lot. if i could a quick second if uh throw a quick little pitch uh what's the word when you say things up uh, anyway <laughs> anyone that wants to check this out check the instagram at lee ross music or facebook at lee ross music i have a youtube channel with a whole bunch of videos on there house of lee ross youtube.com slash house of lee ross um yeah i guess yeah. we'll be uh, hopefully seeing everyone on along the road here you know lee ross will be in your town in new england or north carolina so go see him can't wait. Nick, thanks so much for having me on. I'm looking forward to seeing you up there at the Oxbow. All right. Thanks, brother. We'll see you soon. Take it easy. Thanks a lot. Peace.